Have you ever heard people say, we had chemistry with each other? This is a phrase that's typically used after a date that went well. And while these individuals may not necessarily know they're referring to neurotransmitters, the chemistry can be implied to be neurotransmitters. See, depending on the surplus or deficiency of any one of these chemicals in our nervous system, we can affect our mood significantly. In this module, we will name and explain the classes of neurotransmitters. There are over 100 neurotransmitter substances that have been identified. The small neurotransmitters have been broken down into three classes of conventional small molecule neurotransmitters. Looking at the amino acids, the monoamines, and acetylcholine. There is also a chord group of various small molecule neurotransmitters which are often referred to as unconventional neurotransmitters and the reason why we call them that is because the mechanisms of action are unusual. There is also one uh, large molecule neurotransmitter that we call neuropeptides. We'll be talking about how each of these contribute to behavior and mental processes. In this slide, you can appreciate the small summary, short su summary of some of these neurotransmitters. And serotonin, which is one of the ones that's possibly most popular because of its uh, appearance in explaining depression and anxiety, helps uh, with mood and temperature regulation, aggression, and sleep cycles. We find that individuals who suffer from depression are likely to have low levels of serotonin, whereas individuals who suffer from manic episodes are, have high levels of serotonin. Dopamine is a motor function and reward, and we see this present a lot with individuals that are engaging in pleasurable activities. Uh, after getting off a roller coaster, you're likely to have high levels of dopamine. And also, individuals who consume drugs recreational or otherwise are also likely to have a dopamine rush, which makes the behavior addictive. Acetylcholine is involved in muscle contraction at the peripheral nervous system and also cortical arousal at the central nervous system. We'll be talking about this a little bit more so later. Nandamide uh, basically it helps in reduction of pain uh, and it also uh, serves a purpose in increasing the appetite. Please note that these neurotransmitters work in tandem with others. As you can see, norepinephrine here is involved in functions like mood, hunger, and sleep, which seems to overlap and be very similar to serotonin. Again, please note that a behavior and a mental process is not just one of these, but a combination of many of these. GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter, whereas glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter. Uh, we find glutamate is highly active when we are relaying sensory information and learning and so I'd like you to pause the video and think about where glutamate would be found in our brain given the description of its role in relay of sensory information and learning. If you paused and came back and now know the answer you and if you guessed thalamus you are correct. And the reason why is because that is the relay station in our brain, one of them at least. We would also have the mammillary bodies as we learned in chapter 3. The four most widely studied amino acid neurotransmitters are glutamate, aspartate, glycine, and GABA. Please note that these are usually found at fast-acting directed synapses in the central nervous system. Glutamate is the most prevalent excitatory neurotransmitter in the nervous system. This is common in proteins that uh, we consume, and it is also found in relay sensory information actively enrolled, so as we stated earlier, in the thalamus. Gamma aminobutyric acid, also known as GABA, is synthesized from glutamate. And this is interesting because whereas glutamate is the most prevalent excitatory neurotransmitter in the CNS, GABA is the most prevalent inhibitory 
neurotransmitter in the CNS. But we know that this has excitatory effects at certain synapses. GABA is uh, commonly uh, found in over-the-counter treatments for individuals who are seeking relief for anxiety. And this can have a calming effect. However, some individuals have an adverse reaction and it actually can uh, aggravate their existing anxiety. The vitamin B6 derivative, pyridoxal phosphate, is a cofactor in the synthesis of GABA, which is why seizures occur in vitamin B6 deficiency. Benzodiazepines act by enhancing the effect of GABA on GABA receptors, whereas caffeine has an opposite effect on inhibiting GABA release. Prolonged use of benzodiazepine results in adaptation of the receptors to their use, and it can no longer serve the purpose of relaxation. Aspartate and glycine are common and proteins that we consume, and these have excitatory and inhibitory functions, respectively. Foods that uh, have a lot of asp aspartic acid are uh, milk and dairy products, especially cheese and protein supplements, milk from whey protein, uh, eggs, fish. And we also have some plant foods with uh, aspartic acid, like beans, soy, uh, lentils, peanuts, and in cereals, we also find it in oats and corn. Various vegetables, such as asparagus, spinach, pumpkins, pumpkins, carrots, and fruits like oranges, pears, papaya, bananas, grapes, mangoes, all of these are known for high aspartic acid. Remember, uh, aspartate, which is an excitatory, has an excitatory function, and with the consumption of all these, can increase the firing of neurons. Glycine, he has, which has inhibitory functions and many other functions in our body, can be found in foods like animal proteins and bone broth. Amounts tend to be small overall, so you need to consume supplements if you want to obtain a higher dose, but there. Uh, are a lot of benefits to consuming a glycine and having gl good amounts of glycine in our system. Pro uh, it, it helps with muscle growth, repairing and protecting joints and cartilage, digestion, uh, slowing the effects of aging and building immune system, and the nervous system, which is of interest to us, is where it calms the nerves and feeds the brain by regulating nerve impulses throughout the body by balancing electrolyte levels such as calcium chloride and potassium and so that may sound familiar to you uh, it's potassium is one of the ions that is actively involved in resting potential and action potential and also it is uh, used to improve energy in athletes as well as fight fatigue uh, and promoting restful sleep monoamines are slightly larger than amino acid neurotransmitters, uh, but their effects tend to be more diffuse, meaning more spread out over a large area, whereas the amino acid neurotransmitters tend to be a lot more localized and centralized. Please note that we call them monoamines because each is synthesized from a single amino acid, hence mono. We have two large subgroups of monoamines, catecholamines, and endolamine. Please note that the monoamines are present in small groups of neurons whose cell bodies are, for the most part, located in the brainstem. These neurons often have highly branched axons with many uh, strong beats of synapses from which monoamine neurotransmitters are diffusely released into the extracellular fluid. Note that norepinephrine, one of the catecholamines is also used as a drug to raise blood pressure. This is called noradrenaline. Epinephrine, another one of those catecholamines, is, uh, has been used in pharmacological investigation and it's made major contribution to the understanding of the autonomic nervous system and the function of the sympathetic system. 
Epinephrine remains a useful medicine for several emergency indications. Indolamines is the other subgroup of monoamine, and the reason why is because it shares molecular structure. Indolamines are a classification of this neurotransmitter along with catecholamines and thylamine, and these are common examples of the uh, tryptophan, which is a derivative of serotonin. Uh, this neurotransmitter is involved in mood and sleep, and um, we also have melatonin, which is another example of an endolamine, and melatonin regulates sleep and wake cycles in humans. It's what we call the circadian rhythms. Acetylcholine, ACH, is the only one of its class, and it is made up of the acetyl group plus a choline molecule. This neurotransmitter is found at neuromuscular junction, and as you will learn in Chapter 8, it is involved in the muscle contractions at the peripheral nervous system and also cortical arousal at the central nervous system. Unconventional neurotransmitters get their name because their mechanisms of action are unusual. Soluble gases, which exist very briefly, have been known since the 1980s to help and play an important role in the nervous system. It is believed that uh, cells produce nitric oxide and this gaseous molecule, which is involved in the regulation of cardiovascular, immune, and nervous system, uh, help with an array of functions, such as the regulation of synaptic plasticity, uh, sleep-wake cycle of hormone and hormone secretion, and there's a part particular uh, interest in the role of nitric oxide uh, in the understanding of cell death and survival mechanisms in brain cells. In fact, a lot of physiological amounts of gas are what we call neuroprotective, whereas higher concentrations are clearly neurotoxic. So it just depends on how much of these gases we have in our nervous system. Carbon monoxide, another soluble gas, is known to be poisonous in high concentrations. However, in the central nervous system, we know that it affects an individual suffering from uh, acute carbon monoxide poisoning cover a wide range depending on the severity of exposure. We get headaches, dizziness, weakness, nausea, vomiting, disorientation, and various other symptoms. At lower concentrations of carbon monoxide, we can see a reduction in visual perception, dexterity of our hands, our ability to learn, performance and driving and attention level. Around the 1990s, uh, both nitric oxide and carbon monoxide have been recognized to be uh, supposed neurotransmitters. These two novel messenger molecules have greatly expanded the criteria for candidacy of a chemical for the status of a neurotransmitter and our notions about how synaptic transmission takes place. The involvement of these two soluble gases in several important aspects of neural function suggests that agents affecting the synthesis, transactions, and disposition of these gases are bound to have clinical relevance, and we are excited about future research and what the results will uh, do in, in order to help us understand behavior and mental processes. Endocannabinoids is another unconventional neurotransmitter. Anandamide is one of the two known endocannabinoids, and uh, anandamide is a neurotransmitter that's produced in the brain that binds to the THC receptors. THC is in tetrahydrocannabinol, which uh, is the primary psychoactive component in marijuana. Now, uh, this has been called the bliss molecule, uh, uh, aptly named after ananda, uh, because of the joy and bliss or happiness that it's considered to produce. Um, eventually, this anandamide was found to do a lot more than produce a state of heightened happiness. Uh, it's synthesized in areas of the brain that are 
important in memory, motivation, higher thought processes, and movement control. In fact, we also know that it plays an important role in pain, appetite, and fertility, and it helps put the brakes on cancer cell proliferation when an individual unfortunately suffers from that. More research on how to increase this specific neurotransmitter has been ongoing and some people believe that uh, by consuming chocolate uh, we can increase the bliss because it would activate the receptors in the specific areas where we find these neurotransmitters. As stated earlier, over 100 neuropeptides have been identified their actions depend largely on its amino acid sequence. And so we have five categories. We have the pituitary peptides, hypothalamic peptides, brain gut peptides, opioid peptides, and miscellaneous peptides. Opioid peptides are basically endogenous opioids, and opioids basically painkillers, endorphins. And endogenous is uh, basically a word that means growing or originating from within an organism. So the, these are naturally secreted within our body to help us regulate pain. Now opioid peptides include endorphins, dynorphins, uh, encephalins, and other types of endogenous opioids. Uh, encephalins are frequently found in the presynaptic synapses. Opioids and encephalins uh, or endorphins inhibit the firing of certain neurons. We find the highest concentration of opioid receptors are found in the sensory, limbic, and hypothalamic regions of the brain. And these are particularly high in the amygdala and the pariequeductal gray area. Opioids tend to be released as a slower acting cotransmitter, which modulate the action of the associated neurotransmitter, such as glutamate which is being released from the same synapse. Please note that all the opioids are generally inhibitory. They have an excitatory effect on hippocampal uh, neurons that are mediated by the inhibition of the GABA release. And uh, as we've looked at earlier, uh, again, glutamate and uh, is uh, basically the root of where GABA comes from. And that's where we saw that uh, the inhibitory properties of GABA uh, were sometimes seen as excitatory depending on what it bound to. Pituitary peptides are released by the pituitary gland. As stated earlier, many peptides known to be hormones also act as neurotransmitters. Um, one of the examples of pituitary peptides could be oxytocin, which is seen at high levels while women give birth and also while breastfeeding. And more recently, we've found this to be uh, in people who use their cell phone for an extended period of time for a study done at the UK. This oxytocin, this hormone, that also acts as a neurotransmitter, helps individuals bond. And so we see this particular uh, peptide seen at high levels and, and when individuals engage in behaviors that would make them bond with each other, such as uh, intercourse, giving birth, and also breastfeeding. Sadly, this is now seen again with young people when they spend uh, a lot of time with their phone and on social media. We've, we're finding higher levels of oxytocin, which can probably help us explain why it is such, why it induces such levels of anxiety when individuals are denied access to social media. The hypothalamic peptide hormones basically are involved in the aging process of the brain. And so we find that most of these hormone systems become less responsive uh, with individuals that are of advanced age. And this is due to the decreased function of the peptide containing uh, neurons. A loss of hormone receptor sensitivity uh, or a reduction in the output of the target endocrine glands. Please note that uh, the pituitary peptides and hypothalamic peptides work in tandem. As you may remember, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland work uh, to regulate the endocrine system as a whole. So anything from uh, sperm production and ovulation and, and uh, t 
testosterone and estrogen and progesterone and all these hormones are regulated by these parts in our brain, the pituitary gland and the hypothalamic brain. The brain gut peptides uh, are released by the GI tract, the gastrointestinal system, and uh, ingestion of food and, and fluid stimulates the release of a number of peptides from the gastrointestinal system. These peptides are recognized to act as neurotransmitters, and um, they act both in peripheral and central receptors. Many studies indicate that these peptides are important signals in terminating meals, and we find that uh, there are some foods, such as spicy food, that may just not be as effective at sending those messages as they continue opening up the appetite of individuals. This, despite being a full already. And the last, the miscellaneous peptides are just neuropeptides that don't fit into any other of the four categories, and we will not get into those now. I think you have enough information to work with here.